Hey everyone, and welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean, and today I want to talk about 10 Icelandic authors you should be reading right now. I want to begin by generally talking about Icelandic literature and their history of prose writing before going into the 10 authors that I really want to recommend to you. Everything will be timestamped in the description below if you want to jump ahead. Icelandic literature is a thriving enterprise. Uh, even though Iceland has a population of like 360,000 people or something like that, and thus Icelandic is only spoken by around 300,000 people in the world. However, the amount of books that are published in Iceland, in Icelandic, is absolutely incredible. I think the uh, famous statistic is something like one out of every 10 people in Iceland is a published author. Iceland has this cultural emphasis on storytelling, whether it's the long winter nights that push Icelanders to tell more stories, or some long uh, impressed cultural phenomenon, I don't really know. But Iceland has a really long history of both poetry and prose storytelling, going back to the Middle Ages when Iceland was settled by primarily Scandinavian and some British immigrants around the year 870 or so. The medieval Icelandic sagas, written, say, between the year 1200 and 1400 roughly, are certainly the most important body of work for um, any Icelander, and it's really difficult to escape their influence when reading modern Icelandic literature. But the corpus of the Icelandic sagas should be regarded on the international level as one of the most uh, important and greatest, honestly, collections of works that humans have ever really produced. I'm serious, these things are absolute gold mines, and I really think more people should be reading them. I think it was um, Milan Kundera who wrote of the Icelandic sagas that, uh, quote, although the glory of the sagas is indisputable, their literary influence would have been much greater if they had been written in the language of one of the major nations, and we would have regarded the sagas as anticipation or even the foundation of the European novel. And this is sort of a theme for Icelandic literature throughout history. It's often neglected on an international level, but if it was written in French or German or English, a lot of this literature would be perhaps more widely regarded. But that doesn't stop Icelanders from writing in their native language, and this should only encourage you to read more of it. So for those of you who might be interested in reading the Icelandic sagas, as I just noted, they are you know foundational for um, most Icelandic writers, um, I'll quickly, very, very quickly, go through a good, a good place to start. There are different genres of sagas, but perhaps the most famous are the Islendingasogur, or the Sagas of the Icelanders, which are a body of prose work that recount the lives of historical individuals um, and their families in Icelandic history. If you're interested in reading them in English, I highly recommend um, this volume put out by Penguin and with an introduction by um, Jane Smiley. Um, it's a really good introduction that has the major sagas that are really good for someone who is coming into this genre without knowing that much about them. This volume has Gisli Saga, um, and it has El Saga, as well as the Vinland Sagas, the Sagas of the Greenlanders, and Eric the Red Saga, which recount the um, discovery and attempted settlement of North America. And all four of these sagas would be a really good introduction to the genre. Um, they're all relatively easy to follow, and they'll get you into the major themes that a lot of the sagas are really interested in. And in fact, if I had to pick one saga to tell someone to start with, I would say start with Gisli Saga. It's only around 50 pages in a modern edition, um, and you really get a sense for what these what these things are interested in. And after Gisli Saga, I would recommend trying out Eros Skallagrimsson Saga, um, which is one of the best sagas written, but it's very, very easy for modern readers to follow. But that's enough of the sagas for now. Um, again, I, perhaps I'll make another video on the introduction to the uh, sagas of the Icelanders. Um, but if you're interested, this volume is pretty good, and there's a paperback version um, floating around that's available for relatively cheap. Um, it's a great starting point. But let's fast forward out of the Middle Ages and into the modern world. As I noted earlier, there is this just cultural emphasis on storytelling in Iceland that has been there for the past 1,000 years. And in fact, now, in the 21st century, there is more Icelandic literature to read than ever before, and it's really pioneering and smart and an absolute joy to read. So for the rest of this video, I'm going to go through 10 authors that I think you should be reading. Um, and here are three caveats to this list. One, I'm going to ignore the sagas for the rest of this video. 
go and read them. They're wonderful and they're foundational for any sort of reading of Iceland as a, as a country or a nation or a people. Number two, I'm going to ignore crime fiction for this video as well. Um, and I want to make clear, I don't think that genre writing is, is inherently bad or something like that, but I do think that Nordic noir or Scandi noir, whatever you want to call it, this crime fiction genre gets enough attention as is um, for the most part um, because a lot of it is really good. You know, if you want some quick recommendations, go read Ragnar Jonsson or Arnaldur Indrissen or Ursa uh, Sigurdottir or Lilia Sigurdottir. Um, they're all quite good. Or just, you know, go watch Trapped or Katla on uh, Amazon Prime and Netflix, respectively. And the third caveat is that I've read quite a bit of the Icelandic literature that has been translated into English, um, but I haven't read all of it, of course. Um, and my Icelandic is decent, but shipping uh, books from Iceland uh, over to the United States is insanely expensive. So I haven't read a lot of uh, Icelandic literature that hasn't been translated. So for the sake of this video, I'm gonna focus on uh, uh, books that are easily and readily available in English and obviously ones that I've read. I'll list some authors at the end that have been translated into English that I'm really interested in reading, but I just haven't gotten around to it yet. So all of these authors that I'm gonna talk about are alive and publishing right now, except for the first one, who I can't not start with. And that is number one, Halder Laxness. Laxness is easily the most famous Icelandic author of the 20th century. And he's the only Icelander to have won the Nobel Prize for Literature, uh, which he won, I believe in 1955. He writes for the most part in this very realist, modernist style um, that chronicles the life of Icelanders in usually in the early 20th century. He's similar to Knut Hamsun in Norway or John Steinbeck or Ernest Hemingway here in the States. And in fact, Halder Laxness actually translated Ernest Hemingway into Icelandic quite a bit. Laxness was a devout socialist and thus most of his works are interested in, you know, exposing the hegemonic societal powers and exploring uh, cultural issues that the modernization and urbanization of Iceland throughout the 20th century had the, the effect that it had on Icelandic people. His most famous work, um, the one that was cited uh, as the most prevailing uh, when he won the Nobel Prize, um, is certainly Independent People, which is just a wonderful chronicle of, of Iceland in the early 20th century. Very similar, I think, in scope and in themes to Knut Hansen's Growth of the Soil or Steinbeck's East of Eden or something like that. This is, of course, a great one to start with. It's a, it's a modern classic um, and you really can't go wrong with it. Of his other works, though, I would really recommend um, Iceland's Bell, which is all about the Danish scholar Arne Magnusson in the 17th century, who was going around Iceland um, collecting all of these manuscripts, these medieval manuscripts, um, uh, and bringing them back to Copenhagen to preserve. It's really quite good, especially if you're interested in the sagas and the preservation of these manuscripts. Um, also uh, uh, from this list, um, The Fish Can Sing um, is a wonderful and very easy to read, so, and it's sort of autobiographical in a way, um, but it's very much a Bildungsroman of, uh, of, of this young boy growing up in Iceland. Um, and it's, it's, again, really quite short and quite good. And lastly, if you're into Icelandic immigration, um, Paradise Reclaimed is actually a personal favorite of mine. Um, uh, and it's about all of these Icelanders who emigrated to Utah, again, in the late 19th, early 20th century and joined the, the, the Mormon church. Um, it's a pretty underrated book, actually, in my opinion. Um, but you really can't go wrong with laxness. If you're looking for a massive and monumental novel, his world light is, is just epic in scope and epic in themes. And he also has some sci-fi novels like Under the Glacier and The Atom Station. Um, if you're into kind of realist, straightforward, modernist um, uh, prose, laxness is really a no-brainer. Number two, Jon Kalman Stefansson. Jon Kalman is actually my pick for the best introduction, the best entry into uh, contemporary Icelandic literature. He's definitely actually in my, my top five favorite living authors right now. Um, and his stuff is just poetic and beautiful. Um, his Heaven and Hell trilogy um, is an excellent place to start. Um, and it's, again, in my top five series of all time. He writes in this poetic simplicity that blends 
penetrating emotional relationships with the natural world. He's actually referred to on the, on the back of one of these books in a blurb as um, the Nordic Cormac McCarthy, um, which is quite interesting. And I actually think that's a pretty good way to view him um, because that thing, the thing that he does so well is write these intensely emotional um, relationships and characters and embeds them in this, in this brutal and unforgiving natural world that is Iceland. Again, the, the Heaven and Hell trilogy is, is a really good place to start. And it begins with the, the first book, Heaven and Hell, which is only 150 pages or so. Um, but it takes place in the West Fjords uh, around the year 1900 or so. But it's about this young and sensitive man, kind of a young adult, um, who has to face these harsh realities of, well, being an Icelander in around the year 1900. You know, he just wants to stay home and read the Icelandic translation of John Milton's Paradise Lost, but he's a young man in a fishing community, so he has to get on a boat and fish every morning, which is incredibly dangerous. And these books are just so atmospheric and stunningly beautiful. Um, it's, they're really just remarkable. I'm, I'm, I'm really actually planning on rereading them in the winter. Because um, again, they're just such a good winter book. But Jon Kalman is perhaps best known uh, internationally for his book Fish Have No Feet, which was long listed for the Man Booker International, the Booker International, a, a couple of years ago. Um, and that book, uh, Fish Have No Feet, takes place on the Keplavik uh, Peninsula in southern Iceland. If you've ever flown into Iceland, um, you've landed probably, I'm assuming, at Keplavik International Airport, which is on that peninsula. Um, and, and that book had, does have a sequel, which is um, about the size of the universe. Um, again, both of these books are quite good. And, and lastly, his most recent book that's been published in English is Summer Light and Then Comes the Night, which is a really solid standalone book. Of all of, of, all of these books, though, I would highly recommend the Heaven and Hell trilogy. Um, if th they're so good, and I can't wait for more of Jon Kalman's stuff to be translated into English. Number three, Shion. Shion is another one of my favorite authors um, working today, and I've already actually done an author spotlight video on him. Um, so I'll just, I'll link that to a card up above. But for the sake of this video, I'll, I'll give a very, very brief introduction to him. Um, Shion writes these mainly incredibly short and sparse kind of epics in miniature that often deal with mythology and legend and fable. Um, his most famous is probably The Blue Fox, and this is, again, the probably the best starting point, which is just this incredibly short novella, really. Um, and it kind of works in the mode of, of a myth or of a fable. It's very much a modern fable. His writing is difficult to compare to others uh, because he has such a, a unique quirk to, uh, to his books um, but he's certainly one of the most important writers working today in Iceland. But I'll leave Shion aside for now. Um, again, go check out the Author Spotlight video um, if you're interested. And I've, I've also done a full video on his most recent publication, which just came out a couple months ago, called Red Milk, which is a wonderful, again, very short, but wonderful book. Number four, Andri Snær Magnusson. Andri Snær is probably the most dynamic writer on the list. His books are down over here. Um, as he is published um, almost exclusively in a different genre with every book that he writes. Um, and he also ran to be the president of Iceland in 2016 and came in third place. But he's always writing in these different genres, which is in one way kind of frustrating because, you know, I want him to write more of the stuff that I like. But in other ways, every single book he comes out with is unique um, and so different from the last that there's really a diversity there that, that, that is really compelling. Um, but to go quickly through his works, he has a book, um, a children's book called The Story of the Blue Planet, um, which is very much about, is, is very much a kind of fable about climate change um, and the capitalistic exploitation of the natural world, which is something that Andri Snar is very interested in almost all of his books. He also has a kind of, I, I guess you'd probably call it a middle grade book um, in Casket of Time, which is uh, a fairy tale that explores time and memory and stuff like that in such a powerful way that you, at least I forgot that it was a middle grade book. Um, it, it, it's, it's really, really well written. He also has the book Love Star, which is my vote for the best place to start reading Andri Snar um, because it is a dystopian sci-fi book that feels as if someone smashed together uh, George Orwell 
Aldous Huxley, and Kurt Vonnegut. It's a really compelling dystopia that was written in the early 2000s, and it really holds up. It, it kind of feels like an episode of Black Mirror. And then his most recent work is this part memoir, part nonfiction book called On Time and Water, which is, again, all about climate change. In this book, he explores the problems of climate change, not necessarily by focusing on climate change itself, but by focusing on the rhetoric around climate change and the way that we actually talk about climate change. And he, and he basically argues that if we want to actually solve climate change, the first thing we need to do is restructure our rhetoric around how we talk about climate change. And he tries to simplify this conversation to a, a more simple existential crisis in which all we're actually talking about is time and water, both of which people can more or less understand, right? When you get into all the details of climate change, it's very difficult for a non-specialist to really understand. But if we're just talking about time and water, well, you can talk to anyone about that. And what On Time and Water does so well is he puts the conversation around climate change in conversation with Norse mythology. He interviews the Dalai Lama twice, and he has this, and he has all of these really bold ideas about linking Jesus Christ uh, with J.P. Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb. Um, and it's incredibly brilliant and by far the best book I've ever read about climate change and probably the best nonfiction book I've read in the, in the past year or so. Andri Snar also has a book of poetry called Bonus, um, which I haven't really get my hands on, though I'm assuming it's very satirical and tongue-in-cheek as it's named after the um, big box store in, in Iceland called Bonus. And he also has another nonfiction book called Dreamland, um, which I haven't really get my hands on, but it's all about, um, again, capitalistic exploitation of nature and stuff like that. And it actually kind of anticipated the 2008 um, financial crisis that hit Iceland especially hard. I really like the stuff that Andrei Snaud Magnuson is writing. Um, and again, he's also one of the most important voices coming out of Iceland um, and coming out of Europe um, right now. Number five, Oidr Ava Olafsdatir. Oitar Ava is one of the most popular writers on, on, on this list, especially in Iceland. She's won the Nordic Council's Literature Prize, the Icelandic Booksellers Prize, etc. She's always winning all of, the, all of the awards. And she has quite a few books that are published in English. Um, my favorite of which is uh, Hotel Silence, which actually won her that Nordic Council Literature Prize that I just mentioned. Hotel Silence is about this, this guy named Jonas, who is kind of a handyman, but he struggles to really find meaning in life. So he travels to this unnamed war-torn country um, and stays at a hotel, which, as I'm sure you can probably guess just by that premise, he begins to kind of fix up that hotel. Oidr Ava's books are often very uplifting and they're just so human. They're really just focused on human connections. Um, they're really reminiscent of a lot of Frederick Bachmann's works, if you're familiar with um, that Swedish writer. Though there is this Icelandic whimsy to all of Oidr Ava's books um, that you just don't really get outside of Iceland. Further, her book, um, Butterflies in November, is, is, is really quite good. Butterflies in November is about this fiercely independent woman who, who goes on a road trip around the Ring Road in Iceland. Her only companion being this, this young boy who is the son of one of her friends. And this young boy is deaf. There's a lot of interesting things going on in this book, especially, um, because the main character is a translator. She, she works as a translator. And this young boy is, of course, deaf. So a lot of this book is uh, the narrator trying to figure out how to effectively communicate with this deaf child. And further, Oidor Ava also just came out with a book called Miss Iceland, which I haven't, I haven't picked up just yet, um, but I'm pretty sure it's a, uh, it, it, it's a book that takes place in the 1960s um, and is all about 1960s Iceland. Um, and I, I, I've heard really good things about it. I'm looking forward to picking that one up. Number six. Ofegor Sigurdsson. Ofegor is a young writer and only has one book published um, in English right now, but it's a absolutely stellar book. It's, it's called Raivi, or The Wasteland, and it was published by Deep Vellum just a couple of years ago. It's sort of a postmodern, ecologically sprawling book that is really, really difficult to summarize. It takes place in this region of southern Iceland called Raivi, which roughly translates to either like the wasteland or the wilderness. And it's, and it's this region in Iceland that, that is um, remarkably desolate, but remarkably beautiful. There's a few national parks there like Skaftafell. Um, th this area is really quite famous for its glaciers and volcanoes, the very famous Eyjafjallajökull, which exploded in, uh, or erupted in 2010 and basically shut down most of Europe's airports for about a week. 
um, is there, as well as things like Vatna Yokel uh, and, and other volcanoes. So this area is geologically super important and super interesting for geologists, but it's also a very dangerous area in that it has all of these like ice caves that you can get lost in very easily. Um, and it's also just very, very desolate. Again, if you've ever driven the ring road in Southern Iceland and you're just driving through moss covered lava fields for miles and miles, you know what I'm talking about. And this is all very important for our main character in this book who comes to this region as a toponymist. Um, and he comes to study the names of the mountains, and the volcanoes and the glaciers. And in this way, this book really emphasizes and effectively explores the depth of names and naming and therefore how how we map our human language onto the natural world. Um, it blends myth and legend and folklore and history and etymology all into one. And it's, a, it's an incredibly interesting book. And for those who are into like really postmodern novels, um, this is an amazing one to pick up. Number seven, Hallgrimur Helgesen. Hallgrimur is a novelist, a poet, a visual artist, um, who is perhaps most well known for his novel 101 Reykjavik, which was made into a movie in to the year 2000 by the famous Icelandic uh, director Balthazar Kormakur. And this book is actually a pretty good introduction to Icelandic literature as it kind of flips the script on what most people think about when they think about Iceland. I think when, I think when most people think of Iceland, they think of this idyllic and beautiful landscape um, and like, you know, these soaring fjords and waterfalls and volcanoes, but few people really think about just basic kind of urban life in Reykjavik. And this, blow, and this book really just explores Reykjavik in the 90s, um, and it deals with 90s culture, drug culture, etc., stuff like that, kind of the underbelly of urban life. And further, Hallgrimur has two other books in English, one of which he actually wrote in English and then translated back into Icelandic, um, which is The Hitman's Guide to House Cleaning. But he also has a book called Woman at 1000 Degrees. And both of these novels are quite funny and quite quirky um, and quite smart. Woman at 1000 Degrees reminds me a lot of Frederick Bachman or Jonas Jonasson in Sweden. Um, but it's actually pretty wide in its historical scope. It's kind of like a, an epic of the 20th century. Hallgrimur is a pretty good author to, to start with, I think, as his books feel more familiar in a way. Um, uh, than perhaps some of the others. He, he also has a book that hasn't been translated yet that I really want to get my hands on called Hofunder Islands, which is translates as like the, the author of Iceland. And it stars a character who is really based on Haldor Laxness. Um, and it, it, that, when that book was published, it was quite a scandal apparently. Um, and you know, for whatever reason, it hasn't been translated yet, though it did win a bunch of prizes in Iceland. Number eight, Gerther Kristni. Gerther Kristni is a short story writer, a poet, and a dramatist, who, whom I've actually already made a video on one of her poems called Bloodhoof. A few of her poems have been translated into English, and her poems are just these like minimalistic poems that are surprisingly striking in their depth and their beauty. And again, my favorite is definitely uh, Bloodhoof, which is a retelling of this Norse myth from the Poetic Edda, uh, but it retells the myth from the perspective of the um, giantess woman who is basically abducted by uh, the Norse gods. And she also has a few other narrative poems that have been published. Um, she has a poem called Draupa, uh, which is a murder mystery in verse, and Reykjavik Requiem, uh, which is a story about this woman who is abused as a child um, uh, and kind of has to kind of live to, to deal with it. A lot of her poetry is very feminist and sparse and just absolutely beautiful. Number nine, Olafur Gunnarsson. Olafur Gunnarsson uh, is a prolific writer who has quite a bit translated into, into English, um, though, she, though, though he has plenty more that hasn't been translated just yet. Um, his most famous in English is probably his book Trotkirkjar, uh, Trolls Cathedral, um, which is about the building of Hallgrimskirkjar in, in, in Iceland, um, though it's much more about basically the modernization and urbanization of Reykjavik. He writes a lot of these very realist urban books but he's also written uh, a few historical uh, novels that I actually really like. The, the Axe and the Earth is about the struggles in the 16th century between Protestants and Catholics, but it's really about the struggles between kind of conservative old stuff and, and, and all, all this new stuff. Uh, and it's really quite compelling. Olafur has also written quite a few short stories. He has a nice little short story collection in English called The Thaw, 
um, which, which is readily accessible and, and quite good. So if you're traveling to Reykjavik and staying in the city for an extended period of time um, and want to learn a bit about the city and like the building of the city, um, Olaf Gunnarsson is actually a really good place to start. Um, again, his Trolls Cathedral is a wonderful book to read if you're staying in Reykjavik, um, as, as you'll read about all the streets and the neighborhoods and stuff that you'll be exploring. And finally, number 10, Kristin Eriksdottir. Kristin is a poet and a novelist, but she only has one book translated into English for now, and that book is A Fist or a Heart, um, which is just a great title. Um, this book is about these two women who connect. One is quite old and the other is quite young, um, and it's really about memories and how these characters kind of intertwine into each other. It reminded me a lot of the writing of Vigdith Hjorth in Norway, um, as it's lyrical and atmospheric and beautiful, um, but it also because of its meditations on art and memory that, again, um, Vigdith Hjorth does so well in, in, in Norwegian. A Fist or a Heart is actually a, a pretty good place to start, even though it's number 10 on my, my list. So that's my list for now. Um, like I said, um, the, I have a lot of authors that I want to read more of that I haven't really gotten around to yet, so perhaps in a year or so, I'll have to revise this list quite a bit. Uh, but just for the sake of some honorable mentions, um, here are some authors that I'm really interested in reading who have been translated into English. Adni Er, Gutberger Bergson, and Bragi Olafsson. And of course, there's a ton of authors who haven't just been translated yet, um, who probably should be. <laughs> but for now, do let me know if, if you've read any Icelandic literature and what you think of it um, as, as a whole. And further, let me know if you want to hear more about contemporary Icelandic literature. I'd be happy to do a longer author spotlight on any of these authors, really, um, or a, a full book review on any of these books, if any of them sound interesting to you. Um, but for now, thanks for watching.